As long as I was going after the crooks that didn't have badges, I was everybody's hero. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the Vic Fazell Show podcast, a true crime primary source podcast. Today, we're going to be talking with Aubrey Robertson, a candidate for DA. He's going to be our primary source today. He knows a lot about criminal justice uh, and prosecution and defense. Before we get started with Aubrey, I want to tell you that we have another Waco book. It's actually signed by David Thibodeau. David was in town a couple weeks ago and was kind enough to sign another book for us. So, Log in. Leave us a review. Send me an email telling me you left a review. And if you're the first one, we'll send you this book. Absolutely free. We even pay for the postage. We're not like a lot of these podcasts and other places that tell you we're going to give it to you free and then charge you 20 bucks in shipping. We don't do that. We're, we're, we're straight up front and honest about it. We'll send it to you for free because we want you to have it. We believe in what we're doing on this show and the message that we put out. So uh, we have an extra book. Subscribe and send an email. Info at VicFazell.com. Thank you. All right. Welcome, Aubrey. Thank you so much for having me back. I appreciate that. I've gotten great response to the last times you've been on the show. I really have. I have too. It's it's all been positive responses. I mean, of course, my mom loves it. So, you know, that helps. Um, she's very positive about it. So. Good. I'm going to make a point today to call you Aubrey. Okay. Because Aubrey is what is on all your signs. Aubrey is going to be on the ballot. Right. Aubrey Robertson. Correct. And I slur my speech. I was listening to our <laughs> podcast from before, and I've been calling you like Robinson, Robertson, and stuff like that. So hey, Robinson, I've I've been called you know far worse. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll take well, it. I, I don't want them voting for the for the wrong person. So it's Aubrey Robertson. He's running for district attorney Correct. of McLennan County. Right. And I got to remember Aubrey. Yes. Because I've known you a good while, and I call you by your nickname, or at least that's what I call right. you, Robbie. Correct, yeah. And a lot that's, of people do. A, a lot of people do, but you know how it is. You introduce yourself in the professional setting, and I say, you know, hi, my name's Aubrey Robertson, or as a, as a prosecutor, when you stand up before a jury and introduce yourself, it's, you know, my name's Aubrey Robertson, I represent the state of Texas. And so, uh, when deciding to run for DA, there was a lot of question, well, are you going to be Aubrey or Robbie on the ballot? And, uh... I decided on Aubrey because that is how I introduce myself professionally. Uh, but by all means, you can call me Robbie. Uh, if you see me on the street, you can call me Robbie. But yes, Aubrey Robertson for DA on the ballot. I understand. And I wish I'd have paid a little more attention to that with my own name. Because my name's really not Vic. That's my nickname. My name is Victor. Right. And I went by Vic so much in filling out forms and everything that some of my professional licenses have Vic instead of Victor. Uh, a lot of, a lot of my stuff has Vic on it. So it's sort of just an assumed name for me. Right. So I, I get it. No, it's, it's, you know, hey, it is what it is. But yes, on the ballot, it'll be Aubrey. So Aubrey Robertson. Thank you. Well, I woke up to a newspaper article. Front page, top of the fold, Waco Tribune Herald. Yeah. It was some good reporting, better than I've read from those guys in a while on local news. Yeah. Um, and and we'll give a shout out to the reporter. His name is Chris De Los Santos. Um, I thought he did a really good job. He called me the other day. It was a phone interview. And, you know, um, I've kind of shared this story with you a little bit, but it's been like pulling teeth uh, to get, you know, the local media to really cover this, this race. Um, obviously, there's more... Uh, interest it seems in the governor's race or in these state house races but uh, the district attorney's office is is probably the most important race locally um, on on our mclennan county ballot i can't think of a race that's more important than the district attorney's office uh, the da in mclennan county has more constituents than either of those texas house districts 
uh, more constituents than any of the JP races that are on the ballot. And so uh, the DA is the chief law enforcement officer for the entire county. And so this is this is a very, very important race. So I'm, I'm glad uh, Mr. De Los Santos at the Trib uh, reached out and we did that interview and uh, I thought he did. I thought it was a great article. I'd encourage everybody to, to read it. You know, and McLennan County is set up differently than a lot of other counties when it comes to the DA's office. Most counties have a district attorney who handles only felonies right. and then a county attorney who handles only misdemeanors. Right. McLennan County has what's called a criminal district attorney, which uh, that office handles misdemeanors and felonies. Right. So, so you're over everything. Exactly. So every criminal case um, from speeding tickets that are filed by the sheriff's office or our constable's offices, um, I guess any non-Waco PD or city agency, um, those speeding tickets that are filed in the JP's office all the way up to capital murders filed in the district court are handled by prosecutors at the DA's office. So when you go to uh, jury duty at a JP's office, or if you have to, to go and pay a ticket at a JP's office, it's a, it's a McLennan County district attorney, assistant DA, that is the prosecutor on those cases. You know, and I've been DA in this county, and I had no idea about the traffic tickets mm -hmm. because the whole time I was DA, no sheriff's <laughs> deputy right. ever wrote a traffic ticket. Oh, yeah. uh, they're busy doing other stuff, sure. and the highway patrol's out right. there for the traffic. Correct. But uh, I guess they see somebody that really ticks them off, they can give them a ticket. So Absolutely. be careful out there, folks. Right. It doesn't matter what kind of badge is on the side of that car. They can get you. So slow down. Uh, be respectful to your fellow motorists out there. Don't try to get an unfair advantage running that uh, yellow light or sometime lately even that red light. I know, and that sounds odd because that, you know, giving people that advice hurts our business model <laughs> <laughs> as personal injury lawyers, but it's, uh, you know, it's absolutely true. But please, please follow, follow traffic. Yeah, because we want our clients to be in the right. Correct. We Correct. only represent people that it wasn't their fault. Right. Uh, on our on our civil cases, Correct. on our criminal cases, some of those guys it's their own fault, and we'll represent them anyway. We're all the product of, of the choices we make in our yes, life. Yes, we are. So, yeah. So, what'd you think about that article? Um, I really, like I said, I I thought uh, the reporter did a great job. Uh, he was pretty thorough. Uh, I'm I'm sad that it's you know we're in the middle of early voting now, and that's, you know, the first time that the, the trib has chosen to cover the race, um, since the primary. Now, I mean, you'll remember there was a lot of coverage in the, for the primary for the DA's race between, uh, Barry and Josh. And that was a very, um, very heated race of something is very watched very closely here in McLennan County. But then it's after Josh won the primary, it just, you know, all the coverage kind of just went away. Um, yeah, some of the media just thought the primary, and it was over. Right. Because how often does a Democrat win in this county right. anymore? Correct. Now, back in the 80s, if you're a Republican, you were not going to win. Right. You just weren't. Not in this county. No, we had a strong union back then. Uh, General Tyre was here. Um, a lot of Democratic influence. And it, it just wasn't going to happen. But uh, now... It, it's so stacked, but on your race, I'm seeing some potential here. I'm seeing a possibility of a big win for you. Well, and I think, I think what I've said over and over again, and I know you've agreed with it, is there's no reason this office should be political anyway. So it, it shouldn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. It should be about who's the right person for the job. Um, and so I've, I've had, since early voting started, I've had a number of people uh, reach out to me and say, you're the first Democrat I've ever voted for. Um, and so I, I, I feel that as well, that, that momentum that you're talking about, absolutely. Um, but I still, wanna, I still wanna push the message about experience. You know, this is, this is a job, a, a, a very complicated, important job. And as a, as a former assistant district attorney, um, it's, it's not something that we just want to leave, um, up to somebody with not enough experience. And I feel like that's the road we've been going down lately. And that's not, it's not any comment on, on my opponent other than to say he's never been a prosecutor. Right. Um, 
I yeah. Really, Josh is a nice guy. Really nice I guy. like Josh. He actually looks more like a Democrat than you do. Uh, <laughs> but he doesn't have the experience, and you do have the experience. Yeah. There's something else, too. And if for Josh to be a Republican in this county, he has to go to all those Republican meetings. He's got to meet all those Trump people in the MAGA hats, and he has yeah. to be careful what he says. Right. And he's going to have to toe the line for those who got him elected. He's been endorsed by most of the law enforcement agencies, although you've had a lot of law enforcement people voting for you and calling and telling you. Correct. And, and, and you know, those endorsements were during the primaries. Uh, I don't think any law enforcement agency has come out in the general election and, and uh, made an endorsement. Uh, if, if I'm wrong, I'm sure I'll be corrected uh, somewhere, but... To my knowledge, all all the endorsements he received were in in the primary. In and, the primary, yeah, against Barry. Um, but yeah, like you said, I, I've had I've had a number of my law enforcement friends reach out to me, um, and and say that say that they're voting for yeah. me. And it and again, what they're looking at is experience. Yeah, this they know that I've been in the courtroom, that I've represented the state of Texas before. Um, they know when I've handled complicated cases uh, that they've they've worked out well, and so. Um, I think I have uh, a good bit of support among among the law enforcement community here. Like I said, I I, I like Josh. Mm. I think he's a good, solid person. But even if you weren't running, I couldn't vote for Josh because the way he's had to snuggle up uh, to the far right faction of the Republican Party. Yeah. Even with some of the hot topics that were in the newspaper article this morning. Right. He wasn't available to comment yeah. because if he had commented, it would be against what his MAGA friends want from him, against what maybe the sheriff's office wants from him and some of the other agencies that have endorsed him. And let me tell you, as citizens of McLennan County, you don't want a DA that all the law enforcement people love. <laughs> the DA is supposed to be a buffer between the citizens yeah. and law enforcement. They're that that safety cushion in between right. so that law enforcement doesn't get too big ahead and start killing people like they did George Floyd and getting away with it. Well, it's I mean, it's it's a the, just the way the criminal justice system is structured. You know, police officers have their assigned roles. They are there to uh, maintain order, keep the peace, or, you know, remove dangerous individuals from situations and then the job of the DA is very different kind of like you're saying it's it's almost to act as a buffer but it's to take all that information from the police department from these police officers and make the charging decision do we charge somebody mm -hmm. with a crime and so i think it's i think it's important to realize that and i know you do that uh, both of those communities the law enforcement community and the legal community have very very distinct but important roles to play in the system. That's true. And so do our citizens. Right. And absolutely. our citizens don't want to be beaten the head and they don't want to be arrested for crimes they haven't committed, that committed, and they don't want their cars searched willy-nilly and their bodies searched willy-nilly without probable cause. Sure. And, and I've worked with you long enough. I know that you understand what probable cause is. Absolutely. Well, and I think too, uh, that's something that we all understand. None of us wants our privacy invaded. And if somebody, especially the government, is going to come in and invade our privacy, like you say, maybe conduct an illegal search or a seizure, um, there should be mechanisms to uh, make sure that doesn't happen again. And that's what you and I both love about the criminal law, as we've talked about previously, doing motions to suppress in that instance, where you, you get to come in and tell the judge, no, this was illegally seized, and throw it out. Um, but I, I, I take your point that nobody wants to, to go through that in the first place. And I think if, if we had law enforcement that was funded better and trained better, um, if we could get them better equipment, um, but, but really, and truly, if we could fund them and pay them what they deserve to be paid, I think you would be able to weed out some of the, um, problematic officers. Sure. Yeah. We need to pay our law enforcement people better. And one way we could pay them better is if we were spending less money having to house people in the jail. 
Correct. That's an average of 80 bucks per day. Right. And I mean, I'm sure we could all think of something better to do with that $80 per day than how somebody who's been charged with uh, possession of marijuana. Sure. A small amount of marijuana. Uh, yeah, because you got to get rid of those cases, get them off your backlog so right. you can take care of the murderers and people that have been sitting there for a thousand days. Right. You know, $80 a day, when you say just $80, that doesn't sound like that much, but multiply 80 times a thousand. Right. What do you got? Right. Cause that's you, a lot of money. Right. Because you got to remember that's per person. That's How many there. zeros is that? That's like 80,000 bucks, isn't it? I became a lawyer, so I didn't have to do math. Yeah. So well, no, I no. pull out my phone. I think it's 80,000 yeah. bucks. That's a lot of money for yeah. one guy. And then they take him to trial and they get a hung jury. Right. Or or the case gets dismissed the Friday before. Or the, uh-huh. or he gets found not guilty. I mean, and, and that's the thing about the DA's office and... and is is like any other government agency it's a finite i have a finite budget right like there's only so much money there and it's a taxpayer funded office and so whoever the da is has to be responsible with that taxpayer money and i think it's irresponsible to use taxpayer money to uh prosecute people for small amounts of marijuana that's one of the things that josh would not comment on right Right. They the the newspaper tried to get a hold of him for a comment on that. They got a hold of him for everything else, but he wouldn't comment on marijuana. And he wouldn't comment on prosecuting doctors and women uh, seeking abortion out of state. That right. sort of thing. Right. And and again, it's you know with the abortion question, and I don't know why um, the citizens of this county, who again fund the district attorney's office, why they would want their district attorney spending money going doctor hunting, hunting down these doctors, or God forbid Texas passes a law that in some way uh, penalizes a female for seeking care across state lines. That I, I can't imagine something more un-American than saying that we, the state of Texas, are going to prosecute you for going to New Mexico to have a medical procedure done. All of a sudden, it feels like we woke up in communist China. Yeah. And so I, I just... Those types of things, and and we've talked about it before, and the the article mentioned it, but when you start to weaponize a DA's office like that, you undermine the entire credibility of the criminal justice system because now it just becomes a tool to accomplish a political goal. And so it it no longer becomes about truth and justice in the American way. It becomes about going after your enemies and hunting your enemies. Mm -hmm. And, And there's got to be somebody that says no, that that's... We are not going to use the district attorney's office for that purpose. And that is so personal to me because I've been a prosecutor and because I know, and you knew, you do too, the blood, sweat, and tears that those line prosecutors um, ex- expend on these cases. Yes. I mean, the nights, weekends. Right. Yeah. They pour their heart and soul into what they do. And I mean, <clears throat> they're, they're amazing people. So that office, this district attorney's office, but being a prosecutor in, in general is very personal to me. And so uh, I think somebody who's who's been a prosecutor should be the DA. Mm-hmm. I do too. I do too. And, uh, and that's why I couldn't vote for Josh. Mm. It's the lack of experience and that he has snuggled up to that yeah. far right extreme group. Yeah. And that, that concerns me. It really does. Uh, I hope if he's elected, if he's elected, he won't, uh, follow through on some of that stuff, you know? Right. Uh, but in politics, they say you dance with who brung you. Right. Right. You and, know? you know, that goes back to, again, like we've talked about, you know, why I haven't taken contributions from criminal defense attorneys. I know, and I have tried to give you money. I've even tried to sneaky ways give you money. Right. Every, you just wouldn't do it every other no. day. Yeah, no, no. But I mean, that it, it's it's for that very reason that you know there should that that office should should try and rise above yeah. all appearances of impropriety. And uh, when you have when you have people donating large amounts of money or endorsing you, they're going to expect something in return. Mm. And that's just that's just the real world. Most time it is a real world, but I got to tell you, I give a lot of money out in political contributions, and I really don't expect anything in return. 
I just would like for them to know my name. That's all. And say hi to me when right. we pass, you know, that's about it. Right. But I'm not going to ask them to make a decision they wouldn't ordinarily make anyway. Right. I just wouldn't. Well, and, and I'm not even saying that there, that there's a bunch of lawyers in town that would, but the, the thing is, is it's the appearance. The appearance. Right? And it's, it's, if, if they know that, that my campaign is bankrolled by a bunch of criminal defense lawyers or, you know, pick your group of people, mm-hmm. um, there's always going to be this idea that, that you owe something to them. Yeah. And folks, this is how serious he is about this. When I say a while ago, I tried to find a sneaky way to get him some money because he wouldn't take it from criminal defense lawyers, even though I don't do much criminal defense right. work anymore. Right. You know, hardly any, two or three cases right now. For yeah. me, you've got several. Uh, but... Uh, go. Sneaky. Sneaky. Sneak. I... Sneaky ways to give me money. Yes. I was going to get my wife to do it. Yep. I was going to have, I had my wife write you a check and you go, nope, mm-hmm. can't do it. I said, you're not going to take money even from the wives of criminal defense lawyers. And he said, nope, not even their kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, you know, you're going to have a principle. Let's have a principle yeah. about, about something. Yeah, uh, I get it. But, you know, and it's funny you say that because. Uh, I think I told you, but you're not the only you're not the only attorney who's who's made that same offer. Like, yeah. What if, what if my uh, spouse writes the check? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, you know, this is this is a job I want. I don't I don't want I don't want to have to ask other people to fund my uh, application to be district attorney. This is something I want to do. Um, I've worked really hard as an attorney, and so I have the the funds to expend on it, and so. I'm I'm happy to do it myself. I want to do it myself. So, uh, and well, I respect that, Aubrey. I really do. So, I mean, talk- you called me a contrarian. So, you I'm, are a contrarian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you swim against the current. Any politician that doesn't take money, man, right? They're yeah. swimming against the current. Yeah. You know, originally, what the paper wanted to write about was how you hadn't raised any money, right? You know, they're like making a big deal that you hadn't raised any money until you came up with why right. that that was your idea, your decision, and that you were sticking to it, even right. when people were trying to stick money in your face. Yeah, that, there was a, I think there was an expectation when I was, when I was asked to comment about that. And I think there was an expectation that somehow I was going to be embarrassed or yeah. ashamed uh, about it. And I'm just, like I said in, in the article, uh, I think I take pride in that. I, you know, I, I didn't go out there and beg people for money. Um, I didn't ask them to, to, to write a check to me to, to, like I say, fund my job application. Um, so I, I, I'm very proud of that fact. I'm very proud of that fact. Yeah. And I'm proud of you for it. Cause I remember when I was sitting on the other side of that desk, how uncomfortable I would be having to say no to somebody who had given me some decent money right. during the campaign. Right. I had to. Because sometimes what they asked was just not doable. Right. You know, if it was something I would have done anyway, or if it was mm, 50-50, yeah, it might have influenced my thinking. Yeah. And that's why I respect you so much for not, you're not ever going to be in that situation. Yeah, my largest campaign contributor, and it's in the paper, they published it. My largest campaign contributor is a law school buddy of mine from, from New York. New York City. Yeah, yeah, that's the only thing I didn't like about the article. His only <laughs> friend is from New York City. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, we were uh, we were neighbors in in New York, and we both went to law school together. And uh, so he sent me he's he sent me my largest donation of was three hundred and sixty bucks. Yeah, and that's so, a interesting yeah. figure. I wonder how he came up with. I, I hope I hope I have not forgotten some inside joke between the two of us. <laughs> that would make me feel like a terrible friend. Um, but no. I, I like I take a lot of pride in the fact that I, I have done this myself. I've if you talk to my parents, I've been that way my entire life. Just let me do it myself. I'll do it myself. Um, and so I'm, I'm very I'm very proud of the fact that I haven't uh, gone out there and, and solicited money at, at great rate. And I don't want people to have the wrong idea about you because you got a contribution from a New York City lawyer, but you're from Houston, right? Uh, you worked Baylor. hard growing up, went to Baylor and, uh, ended up in law school in New York right. and then moved back to Texas and was a prosecutor in Houston. Correct. When you were a kid, you would work on the farm in Arkansas with right. your grandparents every summer. Oh, yeah. 
that's a good experience. I used to have that experience. Oh yeah, I was, I was, I say I was driving a tractor, but it was really the hay truck. I was driving the hay truck at probably eight years old, nine years old. I mean, as as soon as my feet could could reach down to the pedals, I was driving the hay truck in the field. And then when I did graduate to driving the tractors, uh, I always made sure my grandfather gave me the tractor that had the air conditioned uh, cab. And it had a radio. Air conditioner. So I, <laughs> Don't I, say that. I was, <laughs> that detracts from the image. I was I was spoiled. And my poor old grandpa, he was out there on the on the tractor in the heat. But no. When you're in politics, you're supposed to tell about how you stood on that wagon and had to whip the mules to <laughs> right. keep them going, pulling that heavy load. Correct. No, yeah. no. I was sitting in the air conditioner listening <laughs> to the radio. So it was it was a lot of fun. I had I'd I'd loved I loved uh, doing that, and I loved. They had chicken houses, and uh, for Tyson Farms, and I mean thousands of chickens per house, and I mean that that smell is something that I will never forget for the rest of my life. If if I'm on a road trip somewhere or just driving around, and you pass a chicken house, it is it is a very distinct uh, distinct odor. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I worked those chicken houses myself in high school. Yeah, I know it was disgusting it is and you and i have discussed the vaccinations too right fortunately you didn't get vaccinated correct i got vaccinated so much by accidentally hitting myself because we'd have to vaccinate a thousand at a time oh yeah you know and they put that little thing on your finger and those things don't like to be vaccinated (laughs) no they are scratching and jerking around whatever disease chickens can get i will never get it right i'll never get it I, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I feel the exact same way just from inhaling all of that stuff, walking through, walking up and down those chicken houses. So I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm immune to all that. I was walking down one of the aisles one time between the hanging cages and there had, bec- there had developed a water leak in one of the water lines. Oh, wow. And it just kind of gradually gone down a pole. They hadn't noticed it. And I go walking across. The top looks fine. And I sink down past my knees wow in wet chicken crap <laughs> oh. Oh. I that smelled wonderful oh. now back to the waco trib article you were front page yeah. photo two top of the fold right i mean that's the kind of thing front page top of the fold you don't get that unless it's kennedy assassinated or or Fizell indicted. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> big headlines Rare top area, of the yeah. fold i was impressed with that and I, was, I thought it was a well-written article. Agreed, yeah. You know, and I've done a lot of complaining about the trip because I remember what they used to be when they were in the big building on right. Franklin. And if you've driven by there lately, you know, they're tearing down the loading docks and up in the parking lot. Chip yeah. and Joanna have some plans for that place. Oh, yeah. And now the Waco Trib is in a tiny little office somewhere. Well, it's a real, and it's a really sad state of affairs for our, for our community because um, a couple of weeks ago I reached out to the editor of the Waco Trib because there hadn't been any coverage for for the DA's race, and I I asked point blank. I said, you know, is there any intention on covering the district attorney's race? And uh, we had some emails back and forth, but it came down to him telling me, you know, look, I don't have the staff, uh, the manpower, or the bandwidth. He said, and and he told me he's responsible for two newspapers. And so it is, you know, it's a, it's a real shame for a community of this size and, and a community this diverse, uh, for the state of our paper to be. It really is. In the eighties, we had a strong paper here, a paper paper. It was Mm -hmm. before all this internet stuff. And we had, they had reporters out everywhere. Oh yeah. You couldn't sneeze at the courthouse without them knowing it and writing a story about it. Right. They were just snooping around everywhere. You can't find them anymore. Yeah. You know, it's hard to get a story written. Uh, yeah. They've got most of their news coming in over the internet that they just cut and paste into Correct. the, in the paper and they'll have room for two or three little stories. Right. Um, I miss the old days. I miss the accountability because the journalists right. used to make the politicians at the courthouse accountable to the public. Right. Because who's asking the hard questions now? If, if it's not the reporters, if there's no reporter standing there holding your local officials uh, accountable, who's doing that? Really? And if there's nobody doing that, what are our local officials going to be able to get away with? Right. And then you see a lot on social media. Right. But that's 
doesn't have journalistic integrity. Correct. Yeah. You know, you don't know if what you're reading on social media is true or not. Most time it's not. Right. I, I, I think you have to default to it not being not. true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I really, really miss having a good, strong local paper. Yeah, I agree. And if there was some way that anything I could do to help support it, I would. Yeah. I really would. And we had another good paper here, which was a uh, Spanish language paper uh, run by uh, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, El Tiempo was the name of that paper. Hmm. Uh, Ernesto Fraga. I'd known Ernesto for a long time, ever since he was a brown beret back in the 70s. Oh, wow. Yeah. But uh, he became quite a good journalist and started that newspaper. But then Ernesto had a stroke and it uh, debilitated him. I need to reach out to him. I hadn't reached out to him in a few months. Uh, but I, I, I loved him. I think recently, too, there was a story, I want to say it was down in maybe McGregor, where they had they lost a paper, you know, their paper had to close, close too. And I, I just, if nobody's out there asking people the tough questions, that's, that's not good. Yeah. I don't think that the Waco Citizen is around anymore either, is it? That was a little twice-a-week newspaper back in the 80s. It had been around for decades. And the... Waco trip today kind of reminds me of what the citizen was back then. You know, just not much in there. Right, not a lot of original reporting. Yeah. Yeah. So even though it's just a vapor of what it used to be, I really hope that it can come back and come back strong. They did. Like, I agree with you. The, the article they wrote this that came out in this morning's uh, trip was, I think, really well done. I think, I, I'm, like I said, I'm sad it, it had to come out in the middle of early voting or once voting had already started, but um, I'm just glad somebody's paying attention. Tell us what you said about marijuana. Um, I said that I think it should be legalized. I do not have any interest as an elected district attorney uh, prosecuting misdemeanor marijuana cases. It's uh, very difficult now anyway, because since the hemp law, you right. have to have the lab results. Right. And the lab results are expensive. Most time they're not going to be in. They're not going to be tested right. anyway. Right. So it's almost impossible to do it anyway. And now we have President Biden saying, let's look at these where it is on the schedule. Correct. Let's change its number on the schedule. Well, and issuing pardons. Pardons. And, and so I just I, I just don't think, again, going back to being, you know, conservative with taxpayer money it's a finite budget that the da's office has i i would much rather spend that money prosecuting domestic violence cases yeah or you know prosecuting or or uh, making sure the victims of uh murder victims get their day in court sooner rather than later i mean it, there's just so much more uh you could do there mm -hmm. see i've been on the uh legal committee for the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws for a couple decades now right. normal uh simply because i knew yeah. that this is a crime that's never really hurt anybody right now we have some of our elected officials standing oh, yes. up speaking to groups and saying marijuana is a gateway drug it'll take you to heroin that's bullshit people right. that's bullshit that does not happen. Now, somebody smoking marijuana might go on to other drugs, just like somebody drinking a Budweiser might go on to other drugs. Maybe if you're smoking weed, you have a better chance because you're having to go into the criminal element to buy it. If it were legal, you could go to the mall and buy it, and you wouldn't be around somebody saying, hey, if you like that, you might like this, right. you know? And then we had some moron stand up at a political meeting just recently and say that, in his opinion, all these school shootings were because of marijuana. Right, and and this is this is unbelievable in my mind. Um, it's just stupid. This idea, and and we'll say who it was. It was uh, I was at a candidate forum for the Hispanic uh, Leaders Network here in town, and Doc Anderson stood up and said that after I had stood up and said that I think marijuana should be legal, uh, Doc Anderson stood up and said that. All these school shootings, all these kids that are going in and shooting schools, shooting up schools, they all smoked marijuana. It's marijuana psychosis, he said. And that's that's what's causing the school shootings now. 
is is the marijuana psychosis. And in that same form is when the guy stands up. Uh, his name is D.L. Wilson. He's running against uh, Patricia Miller for precinct uh, two commissioner. He's the one that stands up and says it's a gateway drug. Like all of a sudden, the years and years of research uh, that have been done uh, disappeared. And all of a sudden, it's it's the 80s again. And Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. And D.L. Wilson saying it's a gateway drug. The only thing it's a gateway to is the school to prison pipeline that has been set up by over policing and the private prison system. Mm -hmm. That's what it's a gateway to. Mm -hmm. Because once you get that first marijuana conviction and your license is suspended and maybe now you can't get a job, you are behind the eight ball. And so I just, I, I cannot, cannot imagine people actually want their taxpayer money going to the prosecution of marijuana cases. I, I can't believe it. Well, all the polls show that it's something like 68% Right. Americans think it should be legal. Right. It's right. never killed anybody in the history of the world. Yeah. More people die every year from eating peanuts than from smoking <laughs> weed. More oh. people die every year from shrimp hmm. than from smoking weed. Because no one has ever died from smoking weed. Yeah. I just, I, it's, and when, again, when you see other states just raking in. Raking in the, the dough, cash, man. I mean, just. And, and we, again, I say it all the time, we live in a state with no state income tax. Mm -hmm. So why would we not seek out every source of revenue we can? Why not give some property re property tax relief? Property tax, tax relief, relief, pay our teachers better, pay our law enforcement better. Right. You know, pay them better and expect, expect better. Right. We, can, we raise the standards for everything. That mm -hmm. benefits everybody. It benefits the law enforcement community. It benefits teachers and the education community. It, it, it just, it benefits everybody. And, but for whatever reason, the people in Austin, um, including Doc Anderson, um, just think it should be illegal. And they want to spend your taxpayer money housing people in the McLennan County Jail. They'd rather spend your money keeping people in jail than legalize marijuana. And that's, that's, that's backwards to me. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Talk to me about doctor hunting. You know, under Texas's new abortion law, the a doctor is the one that is the focus of criminal penalties. So in, in Texas's trigger law, it's not the woman that's punished. Now, there's no exception for uh, rape or incest um, in the current Texas abortion law. No exception. Correct. No matter how you got inseminated, Correct. you've got to carry it to term. No matter how young you are, no matter how traumatic it's going to be. The government says, yeah, the government has come in and said, you have to carry that baby to term. That's not your decision anymore. The government has told you now that you have to carry that baby to term. Um, and so in Texas, uh, and it's not this way in every state, but under Texas's law, the focus of the criminal penalty is the doctor who performs the abortion. Um, but as we talked about earlier, there's already been bills introduced in legislatures in other states that would penalize the woman for seeking medical care across state lines. There will be bills filed in Austin on that, I guarantee you. 100%. The, the, the next time our, our legislature's in session, I, I, get, I bet those bills are already drafted and just waiting waiting for the opening bell. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, as the elected district attorney, will not, again, spend taxpayer resources to prosecute doctors um, when there are children dying in the streets, when there's over 50 murders pending in the DA's office, there will be, I will not use our resources um, to go prosecute doctors. It's, it's not going to happen. So we've talked about your experience. We've talked about marijuana. We've talked about not chasing doctors, not going on doctor hunts. Right. Uh, Another issue, and this may be the last one to talk about, is the backlog. Right. How are you going to get rid of that huge backlog they've got? Well, and it's, you and I were talking uh, before we started about the missed opportunities of the pandemic. Um, you know, we're both saying that we should have read more books or learned a language or something like that. But, you know, the, the pandemic was a missed opportunity for the DA's office too. Um, it is easy for for Barry or whomever to try and blame the pandemic for the backlog. Uh, but 
the real the real responsible i guess party for the backlog is the man at the top if he's not directing and leading his prosecutors and teaching them how to prioritize cases then you're going to have a backlog of cases and so i think as da the first thing you have to do is go in there and set priorities just kind of like what we're talking about with marijuana cases let's let's pull every possession of marijuana case out of the file cabinet let's read the report and let's see if it's something we're going to hold on to or not. Let's let's do it. We can do that this afternoon. If you're Barry Johnson could walk into the misdemeanor floor right now and say, pull every single possession of marijuana case. I want them in boxes and I want them reviewed to determine if we're going to continue going forward on them. Right. That's it's it's that simple. Um, and so I think uh, when I'm DA, I think that's what it's going to start with is priorities, setting priorities for prosecutors and reading the file before the weekend before trial right because so many times they get into that file and there are things missing right they have to ask for a continuance they have to get the judge upset with them but nobody wants to make a decision to get rid of the bad cases right that's part of my problem with the last two or three da's offices here yeah is that they'll let a bad case linger and linger and linger at the while they're letting a the guy sit in jail waiting for trial, costing the county 80 bucks a day, right. 80 bucks a day, $80,000 on that one that just had the mistrial on. Yeah. And not only that, but that defense lawyer that's been appointed mm-hmm. and he has to get ready for trial over that weekend only to come and it doesn't go to trial or they right. dismiss it then. The taxpayer is paying for that too, and that's not eighty bucks. Correct. That's a lot more than eighty bucks a day. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and that's what there's all these collateral consequences to the backlog. You know, it's exactly what you're saying. It's not just people sitting in jail for a thousand days, but it's the uh, court appointed lawyers we've paid to get ready for trial or show up at hearings time and time again. Um, that's all funded by taxpayer dollars. And the, the backlog of cases increases that expenditure of mm-hmm. money. And so you've, you've got to go in there and you tell your prosecutors to go through their files, find the cases that you cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt. That is your burden as a prosecutor. Yeah. If you read the case and you look at the evidence and you do not believe you can prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, let it go. Move on down the road. We'll get the next one. Yeah. Frozen mint. Let it go. <laughs> right. It right. Go. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, there's, um, prosecutors have, I, and, and this is my word, have, have in a certain way been indoctrinated to only focus on convictions, getting that conviction. And, which violates rule number one. Right. Which is to see that justice is done. Not to convict. Right. Those words are in there. It's a duty of the prosecutor not to convict. Right. But to see that justice is done. I believe you'll do that, yeah. Aubrey. That's that's the goal. That's the goal. I've enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Is there Thank anything I've so forgotten to ask? Anything yeah. you want to ask? I like this one because it, we did. We kind of summed up everything we've talked about. Yeah, before, we did. So it was uh, it was good. It was great. No, I'm so gonna much. go tomorrow with my wife that you would not take money from, which kind of hurt her right. feelings, but she's gonna vote for you anyway. Oh, that's and nice. so we're gonna go down tomorrow, and unless Greg Abbott is there with some new rule to stop me from voting. You will get my vote. Thank you very much. Yes, early voting is going on right now. The early voting places in McLennan County, there's five of them. This week, they are open till 5 p.m. They're open this weekend. There's hours this weekend when you can go vote. And then next week, which is the last week of early voting, the polls are open until 7 p.m. So there's plenty of opportunity to vote. Go vote, please. And take every piece of ID you got. Right. You never know what they're going to ask for. Don't wear any political memorabilia no. or any anything like that. Nothing. They'll yeah. turn you away. They'll turn you away. Yeah. So. Oh, and I did not mean to imply that my wife wasn't going to vote for you when I said, <laughs> I'll be voting for you. No, she will too. I know. I've talked to her. She's already told me she's yeah. going to vote for me. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, and she you. took that money that you wouldn't take from her and she went out and bought her a new outfit. So, see, so it's well, all, it all Everybody won. won. Everybody won. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Aubrey. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Vic Fazell. During these trying times, you might want to just stay home. And at the Law Offices of Vic Fazell, we understand. That's why we're set up to handle your personal injury claim without you even having to come in. 
just give us a call and we'll take it from there. We can send any paperwork straight to your smartphone or computer. Don't delay, because if we don't put money in your pocket, you don't owe us anything. I'm Vic Fazell. 